but to stand together and help one another in the, uh, uh, to, to face the challenges that they face. And, and it's been exciting for me, and I'm constantly learning. Uh, I'm, I'm reading uh, Viv's material all the time, and uh, it's inspiring. And uh, so, but thank you, that's who I am, and um, I'm gonna pass it on to Dr. Grigg. Well, I get to work with these guys, so it's a, it's a great team to be with. And uh, they say that I speak softly, so I figured I'll put my preaching voice on just to upset them. Um, <laughs> um, but apparently I'm meant to use the microphone, so it's shrink down. Um, Jesus, um, if you want to introduce me next time, Greg, forget all that stuff. It just I've tried to follow Jesus among the poor. That, that's enough. Because Jesus, he, he's the one that causes us to be doing what we're doing. And he came, he fell from heaven like a grain of wheat into the ground, among the poor as a babe in a manger, growing up with, with dirty carpenter's hands that were thick hands. It says he wasn't very beautiful. Um, he was a carpenter, he's a tough guy. He was one of the people. When he spoke, it was with the jokes and the stories of the people, and they loved him because he was one of them. And so if we're to follow Jesus, this is the only way we can go. And if we're to bring the gospel among the poor, we have no choice but to live among the poor as a lifestyle. Um, so Michael's been down there, I don't know, 30 years? He's been down central L.A., for well, me, <laughs> for me at 24. So I'll give you two stories: 24 and 64. 24, um, finishing university, an engineering degree. Uh, went to live in the in a slum in the city of Manila. And I remember walking in and uh, wondering, Lord. Uh, how do I find a house in the slum because my mission would not let me go and live among the poor. And uh, went and talked with the barrio captain and she said, uh, come back next week, I'll find you a house. Mm. I came back the next week, she hadn't even bothered, she didn't think I would come back. <laughs> so as I'm walking out, there's a voice behind me. Uh, um, we have a house for you, Arling Nena has a house for you. And this little seven-year-old girl took me to this house that was leaning over plywood and this big woman came out and greeted me and welcomed me and took me upstairs it was two stories and she showed me a little room six foot by about ten foot by three foot she said you can have this room and she saw my face drop and she said oh and I'll push the wall out here and you can have this other room <laughs> it was her other daughter's room and I've been praying for two rooms upstairs so the wind would blow through one that was public and one that I could be private in and so we began to live there in that slum area of Manila. This is where it all begins, being among the people. And then as I'm in that little room beginning to pray, the Spirit of God began to touch the people that I pray. And the Spirit of God began to fill the room that I dwelt. And this is the second beginning. The Spirit of the Lord is upon you. Without that key, there's nothing. Because he has anointed you. Without that presence, there's nothing to preach good news among the poor. And, and that spirit came and he filled, and the people he touched, they're the ones that came to the Lord. And then it tracks with Michael's story because um, there's a group of drunkards over in the other corner of the courtyard where we lived and I was praying for them, and one day the Lord said, just go and sit with them. So I went down and sat and drank with them. I, I drank coffee, they drank their beer. Um, and uh, as we sat and talked, um, I said to them, uh, what about a Bible study? Just drunk as only. So we had a great discussion about this, and they were so excited because Jesus had come and sat among them. And they had to respond to Jesus, so of course they'd have a Bible study. There's no hope for them in the church down the road. 
And uh, so they decided 7 o'clock Sunday morning, before anyone got drunk, they'd have a Bible study. <laughs> so they're drunk, they couldn't come. And then three weeks later, they'd come to know Christ. And then one of the brothers, three weeks after that, came to me and he said, Kuya Viv, big brother Viv, uh, I've read the Bible right through. How many of you have done that? Um, <laughs> and he said, uh, and I want to follow Jesus, but if I don't get work, I'll go back to my drinking. So like Michael, I began to try and find work. There was no work. I had middle-class friends. We planted a middle-class church. There was no work. They went back to their drinking. They died alcoholics, except for one. His name was, was Boy. And Boy was a murderer. And what do you do with a murderer as you're forming a church? And uh, God touched Boy, and he became a pastor. And last time I was with him, he, he walked in uh, to my little house. It was 9 o'clock at night. And he said, oh, could you viv? I just led 53 men to Christ and we started a church in the prison tonight. <laughs> and God had taken the murderer and he'd become a pastor. And this is where it begins, searching for work and not finding work. And the drunkards going back. And the prostitutes leaving their prostitution. And then you hear the story in the community, she went back. So you're walking out of the community and she's walking there and you catch up and you begin to talk. And you know where she's going to, and she knows that you know. And she talks to you about how she so loved the worship times at the church. And you walk in silence. And most go back. And you just suffer inside. But some remain, and some begin to birth a church. And so that's the third key, is the formation of a community of faith. Because without the people of God, how can you have the leadership to bring about the transformation? Because when the Spirit of the Lord is upon us, he appoints us to preach good news. And the end result of that passage in Isaiah 42 and the other servant psalms is justice for the nations. And some of you think justice is, let's go demonstrate. But Jesus says something quite different in the way he approached it. There may be a place for demonstrations. But how do you bring justice if you don't have leaders and people in the community? So quietly, gradually, um, I got given $1,000 to get married. And I didn't know who to marry. Um, <laughs> so as the church formed, I gave it to the church and said, what will you do with $1,000? <laughs> so they sat around and discussed it, and they decided we'll have a revolving loan fund. Anybody can, come, anybody can come with a proposal for a, a loan to set up a small business. And so the next week, everybody gathered, and here were the proposals. They had to be written out, and they had to have a budget. And none of the budgets added up, but that didn't matter. <laughs> and they had these amazing proposals to set up a, a pizza store. And I'm thinking, pizza in Manila? They eat fish and rice for breakfast. And for lunch, it's fish and rice, and dinner, it's rice and fish. <laughs> but, but the others, oh, I have pizza store. Where will you put it? Down on Araneta Avenue. We've already paid off the police. We know where to go. How much do you need? We need 300 pesos. How will you repay? Well, here's our way of repaying it. That year, we gave out 20 loans. 18 were repaid. 18 families came out of poverty. And this is the beginning of justice, the community of faith is a community of economics. And this for me was the beginning of struggling with the theology of economics and what does it mean. Um, and so that continued to develop. From that community, there's over 5,000 small businesses that have developed because of the Christians that worked with us in that community. But uh, justice, essentially, the slums are places of dispossession. First in the province, they're dispossessed of their land and increasingly by the multinationals, like dull pineapple. When you eat the pineapple, next time you eat it, remember the poor. Dispossessed there and then dispossessed as they arrive in the city because there is no land. So they become squatters, slum dwellers. 
And here in L.A., they end up three families in a room, and we lived in East L.A. in a little house. How many fa houses in East L.A.? Three families per room, squatters, dispossessed, no place to live. So how do you deal with the issue of land and land rights? And so in our community, before me, there'd been a Catholic priest. And he was a wise man, um, mostly. <laughs> and uh, he'd organized the people. I learned from him. And one day, President Marcos sent in bulldozers to bulldoze down the community so that they could put up high-rise apartments, make money. And so quickly... Uh, this priest, he called the people and told them to lie in front of the bulldozer. And he talked with the, he called the city mayor with whom he'd made friends. <laughs> and uh, he said, look, we've got a violent situation here. It would be wise for you as the mayor to come down before there is bloodshed. And then he called the newspapers and he told the mayor he was calling the newspapers and told the newspapers, there's a great story for you here. And he talked to the bulldozer driver and said it would be wise not to bulldoze down the houses because the mayor is coming and the TV cameras are here. You might get into trouble. And the police chief that was there, part of bulldozing down the houses, he suggested maybe he just wait till We got half the land for the poor. And with that, we're able to rebuild the community. People got their own houses. And I watched the day when Madame Imelda Marcos came in, in her limousines, with pieces of paper, titles to the land. They weren't really titles, they were back in the office, but pieces of paper. <laughs> and everybody stood around on the basketball court, and they were given the rights to the land. 25 years to pay it off, 400 pesos a month, which they could afford. Small plot of land, 20 foot by 20 foot. And I listened as they built their houses. And as the women made cups of coffee while the husbands brought in the concrete blocks. And that week, 400 people came to Christ because the soul of the people had been reconnected to the land. Because from dust we come and to dust we return. It's Lent, isn't it? <laughs> and our souls somehow have to be connected. And the foundation of a capitalist society is the land for that reason. And that's the foundation of biblical economics. So I'm 24, maybe 28 by that time. And so there's the question, what am I doing now? <laughs> Can you sustain this kind of lifestyle over the years? Went from Manila to Calcutta and worked there in that city and laid some seeds, laid some foundations, and then these things multiplied to many different cities. Two years ago, as in, uh, maybe two and a half years ago in Nairobi, and I began to speak to a gathering of leaders about the land and a biblical theology of the land. And afterwards, a very gracious woman came up to me and sat down and said, does that mean that we can have a jubilee where the land is returned to the people. And I didn't say a word because I didn't have to because God was sitting between us. She organized. She organized thousands of people. They demonstrated. They marched. They organized the politicians. They organized the lawyers to change the laws of Kenya so that people in the slums could get rights to the land. It's still ongoing, but this is part of a whole process. Um, I don't know when I was in Mumbai with uh, Alyssa here as a Matul graduate, along with Kim next to her. Um, when was I in Mumbai? 13, uh, maybe a couple of years ago. And again, we, we laid the foundation for a land rights network of evangelical Christians in India. So what am I doing at 64 is laying the foundations of movements because movements are the key to social change. Movements are that which put pressure on governments. So 
for land rights. And, and yesterday on the phone to the leader of the global movement, how do we facilitate this in Latin America? Um, and if you take the economics, how does it multiply? So the theology multiplies, it begins to be taught around the world in different places, and then out of that are birth organization after organization after organization. Because the word of God, which is theology, that word of God has a life to create, and it creates structures. The word of God is the source of our structural regeneration. And so how do we impact the economic structures that are creating the poverty in the slums? We begin where Jesus began, and we just watch the seeds begin to ripple until it begins to affect the very upper levels of structures. So that's what I've been doing while these guys have been working on the same here. <laughs> so uh, I don't know if you um, have any follow-up or things that you want to add at this point. We've got a little bit of time, and I know that uh, we are going to have some questions from the audience here in a minute. Um, but, uh, but perhaps um, I know with folks of your caliber and character and the way that you have uh, lived your lives, um, it'd be interesting for me to maybe hear uh, a response of just a, a couple minutes or whatever you might uh, think of uh, in response to this idea of, uh, of incarnational ministry or ministry after the fashion of the incarnation uh, it's kind of a multifaceted animal and it would be interesting to to me to hear kind of where you land on that in a way that sort of supports uh perhaps what you said and what you shared so um yeah. I, I take uh, the word solidarity as much more helpful for me mm -hmm. because i know within certain movements in especially in the u.s of wanting to move into community doesn't always make you part of the fabric of that community. Uh, you can move in and be very isolated or not connected until a certain period of time. So just because you live in a, let's say, marginal community doesn't mean that you are experiencing the same things as, as Kevin was talking about, or you may see it, but not experiencing it. So, but incarnation for me was really heavily influenced by um, Gustavo Gutierrez's book, uh, The Theology of Liberation, and then later on, um, Segundo's book, uh, the, the Liberation of Theology, which really talked about moving in the path of Christ and coming alongside of, which an accompaniment. And I know with Roman Catholic thinking, that's always been part of the social thinking. And so it was new for me to come alongside, not just to come in and say, I'm here. I mean, I mentioned with kind of tongue in cheek that I was kind of like the new Messiah coming to LA and I'm gonna change things, but it was, wow, I needed to really rethink that, that it's an accompaniment that I, begin to feel and understand because I have a choice to leave. Yeah. That's a significant understanding that um, Harvey Cox t yeah. taught me when I met, bumped into him in Mexico City teaching a class. And, and so he says, you, you, if you have a problem, you, you, you can call home and they'll, they'll take you home back to the US. And here, they don't have that choice. You know, this is a lot in life and how do we begin to that, which maybe reflect again and I grew up in a Spanish-speaking environment and church. And so in, the, in our Spanish Bible, the, there's no, the translation for righteousness is justicia. Yeah. So I always heard about the justicia de Dios, the justice of God. And so I thought that was part and parcel, again, of the life of what we're supposed to be about. And justicia, in terms of the ultimate, was God became flesh and dwelt among us. And so... That's the only paradigm and model that I had personally from my path. And so the opportunity to come to LA was, wow, can I live this out? You know, can I live? And so I told the pastor, I said, there's a number of, there are three things that I asked to do. One of them was, I need, I want to move in and be with the community. And eventually the whole staff moved into the community. But uh, that, that was a really important part of it. But that it's not just moving alongside of, it's, re it's really living and hearing. And also cognizant that I'm blessed because I'm not going to be fully into that because I will be, I can move, right? I can do other things, but understand the captivity. We can kind of look back scripturally, the captivity of people. 
And for my guys, Spyro and those guys, their captivity was they, they didn't see anything beyond where they live, right? And so to live and to understand that was transformative to say I have to deny myself. I knew that one. Didn't pick up the cross and follow Christ. And for me, Christ was being coming alongside of these homies, you know, and visiting them and understanding. Now, let me just say a little quick, I told you the story of getting them jobs, right? It was easier to get jobs then because they didn't have to get e-verified, <laughs> you know? They didn't have to bring all these documents in to determine that they're, they're legitimate individuals that can be employed. But they still, they, they, they proved they could be good employees. They didn't have to have a document. So now I think it would be even tougher. That's why justice is even, even more in, you know, relevant to me in terms of bringing change to allow everyone who wants to work, can work, to work. And I don't, I don't know too many people that just want to come and just kick it here. <laughs> they do want to be viable individuals who are productive and providing for the family. Uh, you know, for me, I think, I, I love the theme. I, I don't know which theme I heard, but I heard the uh, Micah 6-8 theme. Uh, I know that there were a couple of different flyers, but, um, uh, and I've been thinking quite a bit about mercy um, as we were uh, uh, gearing up for, for this, um, this event. And um, mercy meets people right where they are in the concrete situations of their lives. And... Um, and to, to walk with them and to bear burdens with, uh, with people. That's what it means to me to be uh, in proximity uh, or, or in solidarity with, with others. Uh, theology oftentimes comes from way up high, you know, from uh, like trickling down out of the, the cognitive reach of people, uh, beyond the, the, their linguistic reach, and they, and it, um, um, but, but mercy meets them where they are, where you feel what they feel. Um, there's something that I, that I do in my, my church. I, I, I have a door from my office where I can walk right up on the stage, but I walk in with everyone. You know, I sit with everyone. Uh, they come to my house to visit, um, and um, being with people, it, it matters quite a bit in our community um, that uh, the pastor is not imported. Uh, he's here with us, and he walks with us, and, and so to be um, incarnational, uh, to be in proximity with those, in solidarity with those that are in the city, um, is absolutely uh, important uh, to really touch a, a, a community of, of hurting people. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's much more complicated than that, <laughs> especially when you've got families. And uh, when you're, you're um, pretty fragile as people. So I think my people are going in and out of the slums. As Candace just walked in to join Kim and the others who are my tool graduate. They just spent two years living in the slums or 18 months overseas. And, uh, you know, we don't always cope with that. So right now we're not living among the poor as a family. My wife is a chaplain. Our house is always full of Brazilians. She's Brazilian in need, and so we're constantly ministering, but we needed a time out after 25 years. Yeah. Our kids needed time out um, as they moved through this stage of life at university. Um, so there's a, there's a going in, there's a coming out for us. That's part of the more mobile apostolic role in contrast with the more pastoral uh, dimensions. Um, so it can be a complicated lifestyle, which can't be done on your own. You're part of yeah. movements that, that yeah. can work together to engage. Yeah, excellent. This might be a good time for questions from the audience. We're going to take a minute and uh, do a little uh, change here of structure. And then this way you guys can pass the microphone. Um, and then I can hand the mic to people who have questions. So. Is there anybody who has a question for our panel? Or tonight? rebuttal. Yeah, <laughs> comments. Yes. All right. I'm going to hold my game. 
My, my name is Ignacio Castuera. I came because I heard that Michael Mata 